Hey everyone, welcome to session 105 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. In today's episode, I speak with Deidre Sturm and Ann Denning from the Consultants for Children, an agency that supports individuals with ASD in Colorado. Together, Ann and Deidre tell the story of how they completely revamped their agency's approach to supporting individuals with problem behavior. You know, after seeing not much success with their existing functional assessment practices, they dove deep into the work of Dr. Greg Hanley and his colleagues. After taking all the online professional development that's available on the ISCA, or the Practical Functional Assessment Approach, as it's being referred to these days, Deidre and Ann, along with the rest of their colleagues at the Consultants for Children, began slowly rolling out this process on an agency-wide basis. During this conversation, we cover how they got started with this process, what they've learned from implementing these procedures in the real world, especially in the context of telehealth. They did this all during the pandemic uh, and lots, lots more. What I really love about this story is this is, like I said, real world stuff. This is not ivory tower stuff. This is not a university clinic with two-way mirrors. These are everyday behavior analysts out implementing these practices with uh, consumers in the community. So um, I, I hope you really relate to what they have done here. It's a really fun story. As an aside, an ad-free version of this show has already been shared with members of my Patreon group, which you can learn more about at patreon.com forward slash behavioral observations. Also, if you're a member of the all access tier or above, you have access to a 20% discount code to all of FTF's online trainings. So if you like what you hear on this show and you want to learn more about how to implement the PFA process in your organization or with the individuals that you serve, you know, one of the things you might consider doing is signing up for the Patreon. The disc, there's lots more benefits than, than getting an ad-free podcast and things like that. But the discounts alone to the FTF online trainings is probably worth the price of admissions uh, as a standalone benefit. So uh, again, if you want to learn more about that, go to behavioral observation, excuse me, go to patreon.com forward slash behavioral observations. And uh, in addition to that, this session is brought to you with generous support from Gateway Learning Group and their Autism Leadership Academy. Designed for regional directors, the Autism Leadership Academy develops motivated BCBAs into successful leaders in the autism field. If you're interested in running your own regional center and want to learn the skills to do so successfully, check out gatewaylg.com forward slash BOP. That's gatewaylg.com forward slash BOP. And note that there are immediate openings available in Texas. And BCBAs across the United States are encouraged to apply. We're also brought to you by HRIC Recruiting. Barb Voss has been placing BCBAs in permanent positions throughout the United States for just about a decade. And more generally, she's been in the business of recruiting for over 30 years. And when you work with HRIC, you work directly with Barb. There's no middleman. You access highly personalized services. So if you're about to graduate, if you're looking for a change of pace, or if you are you know, just want to know if the grass really is greener on the other side, head on over to hricolorado.com to schedule a confidential chat with Barb right away. That's hricolorado.com and have a chat with Barb. Okay, I think that's it for opening remarks. So without any further delay, please enjoy this fun and educational episode with the Consultants for Children, Deidre and Anne. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. All right, I'm joined by Ann Denning and Deidre Sturm from Consultants for Children. Ann and Deidre, welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you guys doing today? We're doing good. Great. Good morning, Matt. Good morning. We're so glad to be here after listening to so many episodes of the Behavioral Observations podcast. Yeah. The, the, uh, uh, I'm happy you guys could join me. And I'm, thank you, uh, uh, Deidre, for reaching out too. And so I, I guess I, one place I'd like to start is maybe talking a little bit about that because you, you, uh, you did reach out to me and say, hey, you know, I've got, <laughs> we, 
You've adopted I made this pitch. model. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah. I, I, you know, I debated whether or not to share that because then I'm, you know, I'm part of me is afraid of getting inundated with pitches. Um, and that's a good thing, Matt. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those. Uh, yeah, it's a good, good problem to have, I suppose. Price of fame. Um, the uh, the the opposite would be even a more a right. significant problem for sure. Um, but it was uh, it it certainly caught my attention for sure. Uh, and so what we're going to talk about today is how you guys have adopted the kind of practical functional assessment skills based treatment approach mm -hmm. uh, to managing problem behavior and. And uh, with the organization that you work for, but before we get to that, I want to give you guys an opportunity to share with the audience a little bit about yourselves and what your roles are, uh, and the organization that you work for. So, um, Anne, would you like to to start sure. us off, and then you can kind sure. of tell us yeah. a little bit about what you do and what the consultants for children do, and all that all that oh, stuff. Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm the clinical director at Consultants for Children. I've been here. Since 2014, I moved here from New York. Um, and, and, and you are in Colorado, right? Yes. Okay, uh, yeah. I just want to make sure. Sorry to people. assume, but <laughs> yeah. So um, I've been at BCBA since 2005, and my passion is staff training. And, um, and just what we've done so far with Consultants for Children um, is pretty amazing in terms of um, – what we're able to do through telehealth now with COVID and, but we have, we have, I think we have about um, 15, 16 lead therapists now, BCBAs. <clears throat> We've grown significantly since COVID started, which is pretty surprising. Um, and we have, Deirdre and I have really embraced um just getting everybody up to speed with practical functional assessment. We do have several different locations in Colorado as we continue to grow. We have eight right now. Um, and we, we are able to provide telehealth and apply behavior analytic services across the board during COVID, which is pretty amazing and maintain um, effective and efficient staff training. So we're really excited to, um, be able to continue to serve individuals with autism and different disabilities using applied behavior analysis across the state and reach far and wide. We have locations and places where um, different agencies aren't able to be, like out in the plains of Colorado. We're opening a center. We have centers all the way down south in Trinidad, which is a pretty small town. So we try to serve anybody that maybe cannot be served because of location. And we don't want any barriers to uh, stop our, our service provision. So we're pretty excited about that. And it's a great organization. Great, great. Well, we'll certainly link to your website in the show yeah. notes for this episode if people want to figure out where exactly you're providing services uh -huh. or more generally just want to learn more about what you guys do. So uh, very cool. And congrats to be able to grow, not just, you know, not just survive, but uh, but thrive in these uh, you know, yeah. kind of crazy COVID times. So uh, hats off to you guys for sure. Yeah. Uh, Deidre, uh, tell us a little bit about your, uh, your, your role with Consults for Children and what you do and... Oh. Mm -hmm. I'm a lead BCBA uh, with consultants for children. I'm also a speech and language therapist. Um, I'm licensed in Colorado and California and um, have practiced uh, speech therapy for several years. I've been um, a BCBA since 04. Um, I studied at the University of Kansas in the 80s. I actually worked with Don Bear and I'm, um, you know, kind of that generation. So I keep going back to things that I heard Bear say about um, visual representations of data and how we show our data and making this, making effective interventions and what really matters. And that's how we found practical functional assessment and skill-based treatment. We still call it the ISCA protocols. Mm -hmm. um, I know I'm, I'm that sure for many of us, that's a, that's <laughs> That's a transition that, that a lot of us are still making. Yeah. The, as, it, as tough as that name is, um, we still call it that. Um, we are making the transition. I'm trying to do that. Um, and we found it uh, two years ago. We had a pre um, um, using the practical functional analysis and skill based treatment. We were doing, you know, what we've always done. And um, I had a client who at that point was 13 years old, a male, 
And uh, we were at a session. He was having a lot of um, very aggressive behavior in his, in his home and towards therapists. And um, his parents were, cons- you know, at the end of their rope, frankly. And um, I was there one day and he tried to headbutt me. And I have, um, as you can see, Matt, I am not 20. Um, I've been doing this a long time and I did not want to get headbutted. Um, and I knew that I had to find something else that we had to do this in a safe, effective way. And that's what brought us to, um, Hanley's work and to skill-based, um, treatment was the safety factor. And that has become a mantra in our agency is that our priority is safety. I have people say it in meetings. We have, it's become our mantra. And it changes the way you do things when that's your priority. Real quick, just want to take a break here and say thanks to the Gateway Lane Group and their Autism Leadership Academy. It's an exclusive master class in leadership that develops motivated BCBAs into successful leaders at Gateway and in the autism field more generally. When you join the Gateway Learning Group team as regional director, you'll immerse yourself in the Autism Leadership Academy and intensive management training program. Cross-functional leaders at Gateway will share their expertise in leadership, business, operations, marketing, and recruitment. Upon graduation from the Academy, Gateway Regional Directors launch their own ABA therapy services in their regions. With weekly mentorship from senior regional directors, new regional directors hire staff, open offices, and launch direct therapy services in their home regions. In collaboration with local school districts and healthcare providers, they fill needs for services in the local community to support individuals with autism and their families. As members of Gateway's management team, regional directors aim to achieve year-end clinical and operational goals as they continue to grow their region. So if you're a BCBA with a passion for learning and a desire to lead, we encourage you to apply to the Autism Leadership Academy at gatewaylg.com forward slash BOP. Again, that's gatewaylg.com forward slash BOP. And there's immediate openings available in the state of Texas. BCBAs across the U.S. are encouraged to apply. All right, let's get back to this conversation with the consultants for children. Yeah, totally. I want to obviously get into that more detail. And in order to set up the contrast, I suppose. I'd like to hear more about how you guys were managing problem behaviors uh, before you had this kind of revelation, before you discovered these these new tools. Were you guys uh, doing kind of descriptive functional assessments, uh, interview-based ones? Were you doing, you know, the, the so-called standard functional analyses? Uh, how did you approach assessing and treating problem behavior prior to uh, discovering uh, the work of Hanley and his colleagues? We were doing more of a standard functional analysis and um, we would move from that functional analysis and develop programming. And a lot of that programming involved, um, you know, token economies, um, re- differential reinforcement, reinforcement of, of um, positive behaviors, trying to teach a functional communication response. Um, but we were still seeing high levels of dangerous behavior. And, and with, when you- with, when you did these standard functional analyses, uh, you know, obviously one of the, uh, were you having uh, success in um, differentiating uh, hypothesized reinforcers? Uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry, my Zoom just flaked out there for a second. So I just had to <laughs> re-find you guys on my computer. Uh, and I'm going to leave this in because it's, uh, <laughs> It is what it is these days. So, um, so yeah, I guess where I, what I'm what I'm getting at is that uh, you know. So, did you guys find that uh, it was difficult to discern? Fun- were you getting clear, I guess, analyses based off of your standard functional uh, analyses, or was it kind of like the uh, you know the, the data paths with all sorts of kind of noise in them? Like sometimes you'll you'll see with yeah. in, inconclusive analyses. Yeah, I think it, and it wasn't individualized enough. Um, And like you said, Matt, with the contrast, especially with that open-ended interview, the value of that in itself, just finding out way more information than we would with standard uh, beginning interviews like the FAST or um, sequence assessments to begin with, those did not provide us enough information, especially in the beginning. 
And when we started using that open-ended interview, it changed the game. Like we were, it, it was more conversations and rapport building. And we, we got so much more information just by talking to, to the parents or teachers. And that piece in itself, I find so helpful, that open-ended interview to start the process. I think one of the things, Matt, that I found really significant about the open-ended interview, if we start there, um, is that I'll have, we're, we train, we're training a number of our BCBAs in-house on how to use practical functional analysis and skill-based treatment. Uh, they have taken a number of the courses that are offered online through um, FTF consulting, um, but we are training in-house. And one of the things that behaviorists will say to me often is, but I didn't see that behavior that dangerous behavior. I'm like, great, we don't want to see it in sessions. Right, right. That's, that's safety is our priority. That's part of our plan. But we believe the parents that it happens. Mm-hmm. So it is, it's kind of this whole thing is a real, um, it, it'll blow your mind out is what my four-year-old granddaughter says. This kind of blows people's minds out that you don't have to see this dangerous behavior in a session to know that it happens. And to sit with parents and to say, I believe you, uh, because I I believe that you're you're facing these challenges, to say that to a teacher, even if we have not seen that behavior, um, is rapport building. It's building trust with families that have been traumatized um, by these high levels of dangerous behaviors. I appreciate that we're we, we're dividing the behaviors into dangerous, you know, and problem behaviors into dangerous and non-dangerous. We make that differentiation. We don't have to make a differentiation as to their um, function if it's escape, access, avoidance. They're all. It's probably all of those things together. So it's become much more um, efficient. So I, 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 I what? A- it's much more efficient, effective, and safe. Yeah, what, yeah. What we're finding. So I, I have to imagine, though, you even even pre ISCA or pre, you know, practical functional assessment, you were. Uh, uh, this is an assumption, but I, I have to imagine that you guys were were nonetheless uh, interviewing parents beyond a you know the 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 bound you know but beyond the confines of the sixteen items on the fast or the motivational assessment scale. So, mm-hmm. um, I, I um, in other words, I of I. Course. Uh, so w- was it something specific about the questions on the open-ended interview form um, that allowed you to get information that heretofore was unavailable? Uh, in other words, I don't want to, you know, it, it sounds, and I don't, yes. I, I want to be clear here because that doesn't sound like, you know, I don't want to set up like a, a straw man that doesn't exist that where like, you know, if you're using a standard function no, no, analysis, no, no, no. you go in not knowing anything on purpose and, you know, things like that. No, no, so. no. Of course no, not. No. Of course not. No, no. I think that the, and Anne, you say this all the time. I think that some of the questions that are most potent and mean the most is saying to parents, how do you turn on this behavior? Mm-hmm. How do you turn on the problem behavior and how do you turn it off? And um, if parents can answer that question, if, and, you know, I've, I've heard um, Dr. Hanley say in, um, you know, I'm kind of a fangirl for Dr. Hanley. So I watched all of his YouTube videos and sure. taken as many workshops as I can. It's a large club. So I've heard him say that if, you know, if you, I know <laughs> I'm certainly not the president. Um, if I could give you a million dollars, how would you turn this off? And parents say things like hand him his iPad, give him what he wants, take away the demand. Yeah. So it's that, it's, it's that, that um, there's a level of respect to the families that you've lived this, you know what it looks like, you know you're you know how to turn it on. You've been dancing around not turning on this this problem behavior. Um, how do you do that? Yeah, I love that question. So those those are potent questions. Yeah, what stops behavior in its tracks? Yep, yep, and yeah, what's the light switch, if you will? That's sometimes the metaphor that I'll, mm-hmm. that yeah. I'll use. Mm-hmm. So uh, excellent. Uh, so. So we talked about the before condition, if you will, for you guys in terms of what you're doing mm-hmm. before uh, pre pre PFA. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'd like to hear about how your agency uh, learned how to do this. You know how how did you you know how did you find out about it? How did you discover it? How did you get more training? Um, 
and I, you know, there's, there's probably some interest, you know, uh, and you mentioned earlier, you have a passion for staff training, you know, I, I, I would imagine there's probably some mm-hmm. lessons in terms of rolling this out on an agency wide basis, particularly when you guys oh, are sure. committed to remote intervention. So yeah. if you, we've, you we've had make, to become committed to remote intervention, yeah, yeah, by, by hook or COVID, by yeah. So let's talk so about it, like learning about it. Two part question. Yeah. All my questions have like a thousand parts to them. So yeah, <laughs> right. you I'm can take it in any, any order or whatever. But like, <laughs> so let's talk about the evolution of it in the context of your your agency. So how'd you learn about it, and then how did how did it kind of uh, develop, and and how did you guys kind of I guess where I'm going at is how how did you guys upskill your workforce with this new it, technology. It, and that's, and that's what we had to do. Um, I think, you know, I, because I was desperate as an individual BCBA and my team was desperate, we needed to change the trajectory for this particular person, this particular family. Um, I have been listening to Behavioral Observations podcast for a long time. I came across the uh, multiple interviews with uh, Dr. Hanley, and that's where I started. I took the CEUs because <laughs> I love CEUs. Um, I took thank, the CEUs you. <laughs> that Behavioral Observation Podcast <laughs> offered. Um, looked at YouTube videos, found other um, online trainings. I was all set to go to Worcester for an in-person training um, before COVID hit. Um, and, you know, all due respect to Worcester and Massachusetts, I grew up in New England. Um, <clears throat> I didn't want to fly into Worcester for seven days and you know have to visit all my family while I was there, blah, blah, blah. So I was thrilled when it went to online training because mm-hmm. of COVID, it's much more accessible and, and as I think effective and engaging. So I started to take the trainings. Um, Anne and I work, Anne is a great clinical director. She works really closely with all of us. So she followed this particular case. She came and visited us in the home. She observed sessions. Um, we recorded sessions and looked at sessions together. And we, as an organization, and I think you can you can speak better to how we scaled it up as how we. And I want to I want to make it clear, Matt, that we haven't scaled it up as an organization. We are scaling it up as an organization. This yeah. is a process that we are that okay. we're involved in and and doing um, currently. Um, so, so Anne, um, mm-hmm. do you want to talk to that about that a little bit or, or shall I continue? Yeah, I can talk to it a little bit. I, I mean, like as an agency, we started learning more about trauma informed care and, um, trauma informed care, um, really across the board. We started working with Dr. Kulu and, um, the safety protocol. And then when Deidre showed interest in, practical functional assessment and um, I keep calling it ISCA, but we, we really just fit into what we were already starting to delve into Um, because what we were doing, especially with a lot of these kids that we're getting that have really high level severe behaviors, we weren't able to keep staff safe. We weren't able to turn the behavior off with and show parents how to do that safely. Um, so this was pretty much a game changer in terms of our mantra, which is keeping, like, how can we keep you safe? How can Safety we keep, is our priority. Yeah, mm-hmm. like, we literally start our meetings off with that. But um, as just as a process and company goals, like, starting right from the beginning with um, just that OBM kind of side of things. So getting our case managers on board. So we know um, which kids have really intense behaviors even before it gets to the BCBA. So Deidre and I work closely now with the case management department and getting these key discriminatory questions so that we know before when we have some intense cases that are coming our way. We're working on getting the open-ended interview as part of our intake. Yes. Um, So that we have a real heads up as clinicians of what's coming in and what the parameters are so that we can move more quickly. Um, We're also using Dr. Kolu's work of the safety, safety protocols, the checklist and the risk Mm -hmm. management um, and the um, I pass the um, inventory of potential aversive stimuli um, as part of our intake. So we're, we're trying to beef up that end of our, 
um, processes so that when the clinicians, the BCBAs and their teams, the RBTs, the BCABAs, those teams um, take on a client. And often that's based upon location, availability, scheduling, mm-hmm. you know, all of those parameters that they have more information as they're um, going into a home. We're looking at tipping points. When do we tip um, our um, intake to say to the um, the clinician who's going to be taking on the case that this is a person with severe problem behavior? We see this, you know, right now from the get go before you even do a PFA. And right. I, you know, then then the clinician could go in and do a practical functional analysis. And I think what I found so powerful about that process is turning the behavior on and off. It's a very powerful thing to see this ABAB design, to see it in a in our clinical setting and to see us doing that, to see people doing it. They're like, oh, I can control this behavior. Uh-huh. This is how I do it. And that it's okay to let people um, return to the synthesized reinforcement contingencies when they show a problem behavior. That's something else that blows people's minds out. That's what we want you to do. Are you looking for a new job, but you're overwhelmed with all the emails that you're getting from various ABA agencies? What if there was someone who was in your corner and could help you find the perfect job placement? Well, that person exists. Barbara Voss has been working as a recruiter for over 30 years, and her company, HRIC, specializes in placing BCBAs in permanent full-time positions throughout the United States. Barbara has been placing BCBAs since 2011, so she knows our business and she offers personalized service to any BCBA looking for a new position. She also helps companies looking to hire BCBAs, too. Here are just some of the things Barbara can help you with. She can provide information about salary ranges in different markets across the country. She can help you write your resume. She can coordinate and prepare you for the interview process and even help negotiate the right salary for you. And best of all, there are no charges to any candidate for all of these services. When you are ready to make a change and want to work with someone who will listen to you and understand what you need in a new position, contact Barbara at HRIC. To schedule a confidential discussion, head over to hricolorado.com. Again, that's hricolorado.com and hit the contact button to connect with Barbara. You won't be disappointed. I want, yeah, I want to get to some potential pushback for that in a, in a, yes, in a minute. Yes, we do. But, oh, yes. We get a lot. Of- <laughs> um, yeah, that's something I always find fascinating in, in a number of ways. Before we get to that, though, I, I want I want you to kind of go back. Uh, Deirdre, were you, the, were you the first clinician to actually run, uh, a, you know, an ISCA uh, analysis? Yes. So I want, in I want our talk- agency, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, it's, uh, and, and was it with this thirteen-year-old young man in particular? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so mm-hmm. so can you mm-hmm. kind of walk mm-hmm. us through like the first session that you did? You know, I want to get an idea of what it was like to start at the first time after having done all sorts of, all sorts of other things that were not necessarily successful, uh, and and obviously you'll have to. Uh, manage the amount of information that you, you use to describe this for right, obvious purposes. But uh, I, I would right. love to give listeners a, a, so, a, a so bird's eye view if you it, would. Matt, I'm going to wait. Yeah. Right. Well, the first time we did it, we had to do it twice. The first time that we ran the PFA, I, um, I, uh, I was, uh, I ran the PFA, our BCABA, um, was with me. She was she was taking the data. I had trained her in taking the data, and I trained her wrong. So we had everything was discombobulated. The whole thing was discombobulated. We said, oh, you know, uh, we I believe in grace. We said, okay, um, we'll do it again. No, you know, no harm, no foul. Nobody was hurt. The session was safe. That is our priority. Um, let's do it again. So we and this was before. Now there's an ISCA app. Um, this is before the ISCA app. So we were doing a pencil and paper. We were taking the data. Um, and it's, a uh, you know, when you first look at that data sheet, it's a little complicated. Uh, so we tr- retrained, did it again, we practiced, and then we ran it, ran the PFA again. Um, and we were able to, one of the things I love about the ISCA app now is that it tells you if you're able to demonstrate that you can control the behavior safely. 
um, before that, when you're doing it with paper and pencil, you know, we were looking at the data and saying, okay, we didn't have that kind of bleed over of problem behavior into the um, synthesized reinforcement condition um, so that we can be safe. But I, I do love the app because I love something that kicks out a report. So, the, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, honestly, I'm not familiar with the app. Can you tell me a little bit more about, so what, what exactly did it tells you if there, um, there is a, there is an ISCA app now that you can buy at the, at the app store. I think it was developed, um, through the, the team that, um, Hanley's group or the FTF has worked with in Italy. I think those are the people that developed the app okay. and it works pretty well. So you, when you're taking data with the app, you just turn on the app. You, you know, it, it, it's again, one of the things I love about this process is that the data collection um, sheets guide you through the process. Uh, mm -hmm. So in skill-based treatment, the sheet guides you through the process, your data collection sheets guide you through the process. So I find that really um, very helpful. Um, and with the app also it guides you through the process. You turn it on, it lets you know when you've been in a synthesized reinforcement condition for five minutes, seven minutes, and you can now progress the, um, the evocative operations. Um, so um, you're just, you know, it's an app, you're just pressing buttons on your phone. And um, yeah, it's great. It's really terrific. And then um, it will generate a report with a graph and a, um, a written report for that client. So it's, it's very, it's very um, helpful. And I, you know, I love anything that'll generate a report for me. Indeed. So, so <laughs> I got you off track. I'm sorry. So let's, okay. let's, so, so you, you, you started out the process. You, <laughs> uh, um, you guys had a, a little hiccup getting started. Yes. You retrained. Uh, yes. And so uh, take us uh, okay. from, from that point forward. And I want to, I want to also go back even before we did the practical functional analysis, Matt, Matt, we had worked with this family um, for several months um, before this, and they were at their wits end. And I, you know, I had to go back and speak with the family and if we're going to change course. I'm really careful whenever I speak with families about the PFA and skill-based treatment that we do not say this is new ABA. This is not new ABA. This is very much um, ABA based upon very strong historical evidentiary practice. Um, cause dang it, I'm going to start doing the newest thing. It's not, this is very strong evidentiary practice that I didn't know. And as a, as a behavior analyst, my job is to work within my scope of expertise. And if I'm over my head, my responsibility is to develop new expertise. And that's how I was looking at this, that I am not able to change this behavior enough with this, with this client. I need to develop new skills. Our team needs to develop new skills. So with all of that, um, we did the practical functional analysis and we were able to demonstrate that we had control over the dangerous behaviors. There is still, you know, I love that we divide the behaviors into our, the dangerous, the non-dangerous problem behaviors. So we're showing control over the dangerous behaviors The non-dangerous problem behaviors, whining, crying, saying no. Some of those may still be there um, as you're running these, these sessions, but the session was certainly safe. Uh, then we then we started learning about skill based treatment, and that is a um, a process. I think that as um, the I think over the last year or so, as the um, FTF consulting has become has developed more materials, more tools, it's become easier and easier to implement um, in in um, for other therapists to implement it. So we started to implement skill-based treatment with this young man. We were able to teach a functional communication response. And that, you know, I, I, again, um, we used the response of my way that um, Omnibus Manned that um, Hanley recommends. And I really, you know, this was, an, this was another kind of sticking point with staff. Why aren't we saying I need a break? Why aren't we using some of the skill, some of the functional communication that he had learned before and explaining that it's chained with problem behaviors. It's often prompted. Um, it's not um, emitted uh, independently. So as, as we are able to explain the whys, um, we have less resistance. I'm not saying we have no resistance or pushback because we do. Um, and we're, but we're able to explain the whys in behavioral terms that we're doing what we're doing in terms that our staff understands. Is that the most common piece of pushback or are there other things that people will say, hey, you know, this sounds kind of weird. What, what, why are we doing this? 
I think the hardest thing <laughs> that everyone has to get their head around is that the, the priority is safety. That is hard for people to get their heads around. Um, because, you know, we train people in handle with care, we train them in how to deal with unsafe behaviors. And um, sometimes that's a badge of honor that I can, you know, give me anybody, I can work with anyone. And, you know, I've been there, I was, I was, I've been there, done that, um, but have matured past that point. Yeah. Um, And I think some of us uh, older BCBAs were were kind of raised (laughs) in that environment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So that's been, that's been difficult. For people to understand that our priority is safety. So if he starts, if you're seeing this, your clients start to engage in what we've identified and perhaps not yet identified, these are an open class of behaviors. We may not have identified the behavior that they're engaging in right now. They may have learned a new behavior. They may not be what we, you know, considered um, precursor behaviors before. This may be a new one. That's okay. You can still reinforce that by allowing access to the um, reinforcement contingencies. That has been really hard. You're, people say to me, you're just giving in. You're giving them what they want. Yep. They're, nope. they're getting away with it. That's what I they're hear. Yes, that's what we hear a lot. And we yeah. keep reframing that to we are keeping the session safe. You know, recently yes. we had an incident with marshmallows, kids eating marshmallows when they weren't supposed to and should, you know, the therapist was saying to me, I should have blocked him. No, 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 no. You block, you get headbutted. No, you kept it safe. That is a non-dangerous behavior. It is okay. So that's that's been again a really tough thing for people to um, to understand. Yeah, yeah, and the tolerating no, we get like, like you just said, Matt. Like you're just giving in to the client, and how are you reinforcing this behavior? So we get a lot of that as well, just you giving in, how are you reinforcing this behavior? He can't get everything he wants. That's not real life. Right. It's not real life. We know that, but we're in a shaping right. process to teach them the skills they need to be able to deal with real life. Yeah. So that, that's been, that's been tough, but what the, this protocol gives us is the um, behavioral evidence and the behavioral vocabulary to answer those questions and to explain why we are doing what we're doing. Hey everyone, this is the last break of this particular podcast episode, and I'll do my best to make it short. If you are interested in getting an ad-free podcast feed, head on over to patreon.com forward slash behavioral observations, and there are a number of tiers that are available, and most of the tiers have an ad-free podcast feed as a benefit. So if you would like to listen to your podcast uninterrupted, Go check that out. There are all sorts of other cool benefits there. You know, in this particular episode, we're talking about skills-based treatment. Well, the folks at FTF have uh, given patrons a 20% discount to all their online courses. There's huge discounts in the Behavioral Observation CEU store, uh, all sorts of other stuff. And again, you can see it all over at patreon.com forward slash behavioral observations. You can also go to behavioralobservations.com. And right up in the menu there at the top, it'll, there'll be a thing that says uh, Patreon. You can just click on that and you'll be good to go. So I hope you have a chance to check that out. All right. Uh, I think that's it for now. So let's get back to this conversation with Anne and Deidre. And I, I, you know, I think we're going to probably uh, turn to skills-based treatment here shortly, but I would imagine you know, when you've gone through the process with someone where they've gone through the various stages of the skills-based treatment, you probably, I'm, I'm just guessing, but I'm thinking that you guys have some case studies to show some of these staff say, look, we're going uh-huh. to get to yes. higher levels of cooperation yes, and the ability to tolerate, you know, the no meaning, no, right. <laughs> I know. Said, you I know, know. Uh, yes. et cetera, but it's a bit longer road, but it's a more, it's a safer road and it's a more yep. durable road that, uh, that we're going to travel upon. And Matt, I like that you said durable. Because it is, we're looking at shaping up these behaviors in the world of ambiguity. That sometimes you get yes, sometimes you get no, sometimes you get in between. Sometimes you get in a minute, maybe later, whatever. That we're helping these clients deal with the real world. Um, So let me just, let me go to skill-based treatment. Sure. 
And, and one of the things that we have to keep in mind as we talk about all of this is COVID. <laughs> we had a pandemic and that impacted everything we do. So, um, you know, I'm in a high risk category. I've been home since March um, and been doing everything remotely. So we had a really shift, um, really shift set. And with the client that we started with, um, this stay at home schooling, remote schooling has been really hard. We had seen an uptick in um, dangerous behaviors that we hadn't seen in a long time. And we were having a hard time getting, you know, the reality is that RBTs are quarantined. RBTs get COVID. Our, the family is quarantined. So we had this quarantine, not quarantined, and we just couldn't get any consistency. So we spoke with the parents. The parents have been very involved in all the therapy we've done. And the dad became the implementer. And we've done this through synchronous telehealth, where I'm coaching, I'm coaching this father um, in real time. He through his um, you know, Bluetooth earbuds. Um, we're using wise cameras that we can, um, so we can observe the session and we can tape the sessions. What, what are uh, those? I'm sorry. What wise W Y Z E. It's just a brand. I don't know if it's, yeah, it's a remote camera, a remote, like people use them for home security. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I will put a link to that in the show notes too. Cause I know I'm going to get emails. So like what is the yeah. camera that they talked about? <laughs> so yeah, go ahead. Um, and, and, you know, of course we've gotten, we've explained every step of this. Of course, we have all the permission and all the rest of those things to do these, um, to do this remotely. Um, but we had a, we had a pivot really quickly. Um, and we continue with skill-based treatment with this client. We went back and um, kind of started from the beginning and made sure that our uh, functional communication response was strong, that our tolerance response was strong um, and were uh, and then, you know, moved on to developing the cabs. And um, we ran into a glitch, Matt. We, we really got stuck. And um, so I, we reached out to um, FTF Consulting and had a consultation with Dr. G. And um, we're able to resolve our problems. Um, and, and where we got stuck was um, I was being more rigid in when to, I was, I was saying, okay, you can have my way as soon as he started to whine. And Dr. G talked us through, you're going, you know, these very low level problem behaviors, see if you can work through them with him and keep moving forward. And we did. Um, so this, this particular student went from, you know, holding that iPad and his grimy little paws and not wanting to give it up to being able to um, relinquish the iPad, put it on a chair, get up from the chair, stand up, walk over to the table of high expectations um, and engage in um, four to five different activities for up to four to five minutes at a time. So, so the table of high expectations. Table of high expectations. <laughs> It's almost it's, it's almost like a, you know, it takes on a religious significance. You know? <laughs> it, 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 it is almost a religious experience to see someone. The sacrament who, of high expectations. Right? Um, so I want I want to uh, go back just a second here because mm -hmm. uh, uh, the um, the cab terminology is new, uh, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. and uh, or newer to to that than some of the earlier iterations of the you know, of, of this process. So I think the listenership of the podcast is familiar with the, I guess, earlier uh, um, conceptualizations of skill-based treatment where you teach the omnibus man, like you described, yes. then you mm -hmm. teach a tolerance response mm -hmm. okay, uh, and, no then, and then mm -hmm. uh, cooperation with reasonable demands. Um, so I, and if people are, are not up to speed with that stuff, I, I'll, um, I can post, uh, I think it's session seven is where we go into that in, the, in pretty, pretty deep detail uh, along with session 20. And I can post links to that, those in today's notes as well. But uh, what I'd like you guys to do, if you don't mind, is take a minute and talk about the, uh, the what, what is a cab and cab one, cab two, blah, blah, blah. You know? And so for those who are not up to speed with that kind of nomenclature, if you can describe that in a little bit more detail, just so we're all using the same language here. Well, a cab refers to a contextually appropriate behavior. So contextually appropriate behaviors are different for every client based upon their skill levels and needs. 
So as we look at a contextually appropriate behavior, um, the cab, cab one, the first contextually appropriate behavior is relinquishing their um, reinforcer. And often, um, and I'm going to say 90% of the time, it's an electronic device for us now. We're finding <laughs> it's just the reality of our times. Um, mm-hmm. It is an electronic device. So that is our first thing is that the kids need to give up their reinforcer without engaging in a problem behavior. And this, you know, our, the young man that we were working with, um, previous to our intervention, if you asked him to turn off, give up, turn off the um, PlayStation device or to give up his iPad, um, it, it elicited high level dangerous behaviors. It just, you know, it just did. So we did all kinds of machinations to, with that previous prior to um, working with skill-based treatment. So it's different for every client. Um, and this is where the shaping and the differential reinforcement come in, that you're looking at the first thing is relinquishing the device. The next thing, the next um, maybe in that chain, maybe standing up. The next is walking over to the table, sitting down at the table, pulling in your chair. Um, it depends on how granular you need to be in your, in your shaping to get to the point that this um, client is following an adult instruction to engage in um, in a uh, age appropriate skill based appropriate um, activity, so that can be for this for this client. It's you know um, some higher level, not really higher level math, but um, you know regrouping in addition and subtraction. He's writing your name on the paper in a way that somebody can read. Being able to take an instruction that says, you know, I can't read your name. Would you would you change that, please? Would you erase it and write it so it's legible? requiring that they do work and and respond in ways that are performance based that they are doing a high level of performance and and prior to this i assume like you're you know if you ask those same if you pre- present the same request so that's that that learner uh, prior to all this instruction, it would be the equivalent of touching the third rail right i mean a lot it, of it was the equivalent of touching the third rail and if we were anywhere near successful, we were um, negotiating the whole time. Oh, you only have to do one. No, you can do two. It doesn't, you know, like it doesn't matter if they're right or wrong. If you do three, you're done. Um, But we're now dealing in a world of ambiguity. And that is, you know, when I was working with the client um, last night, the dad, he walked over to the table, table of high expectations, and he's now doing some chores. That's one of the chains that we're on. And dad asked him to put, um, these di- the dishes out for dinner. Um, we ha- he's used to putting out four. We're having five people tonight. It's okay. I don't. No, I only put out four. No, tonight we need five. You know, and for other people, you think ah, it's not a big deal. For this person, it was a big deal. He was able to do that because things change. It is life is ambiguous. Sometimes, um, you know, we have a guest for dinner or somebody's home that wasn't home before. So it gives us that that ability to be to deal in in reality in the gray areas of life life is not black and white it's not that you always put out four dishes it's you put out dishes dependent upon how many people are there now now uh, that that's a, just a beautiful example i appreciate you sharing that and i, lo- I just love the dealing with the ambiguity i've always uh kind of lived in the gray areas of mm-hmm. <laughs> things mm-hmm. myself and so i think there's part of me that's just kind of naturally goes in that direction uh and uh so it's always fun to have your beliefs validated i guess but uh, that that's neither <laughs> here nor there um what i wanted to get to is what uh what what have you What's been your experience with seeing individuals, uh, you know, um, request to, you know, let's, let's say, let's say you have an individual like this, who's gone through the various cab stages and now they're doing things that are unpredictable, uh, that are, were previously, uh, you know, significant, uh, antecedents to problem behaviors are doing all these things relatively cooperatively, um, Part of that model, if I understand it correctly, means that uh, it involves at any point in time, if they say, hey, can I have my way on a, on a probabilistic basis, sometimes that an- the answer is yes. So they can kind mm-hmm. of, they mm-hmm. can always uh, have a chance of escape, if you will, mm-hmm. or, mm-hmm. It, you know, or a chance of reinforcement, uh, perhaps put more broadly. Um, 
What what has been your, and this is perfectly fine if you want to just speak anecdotally here, but what's been your experience with individuals uh, at these advanced stages of cooperation? Do they, do they still request the, the, do they still emit the omnibus man and do they mm-hmm. still escape these things periodically? Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if there's natural reinforcers for cooperation that, that come in, to, that, that, that are brought to bear that, that perhaps even render that initial manned somewhat uh, irrelevant at a certain point. It, it's really interesting because this particular client and other clients that we've seen continue to use my way. Okay. Um, in, in more out of practice sessions. Um, and, but they do differentiate. They don't use my way. He doesn't use it at school. He doesn't say that at school yet. He, um, and I don't know if he will, he does other things at school to get my way. He uses other verbiage, but with his mom and dad and at home, he does say my way. And the parents then will respond with either, you know, no, you need to do it now. Um, or a de- uh, de- delay. Um, you know, maybe in a few minutes you can do that or, or if some, and sometimes they just say yes. And we've talked to the parents and because these parents are implementers, this dad is the implementer. Um, he understands how we s- cycle through these responses. We want to keep the my way strong. We want to keep the tolerance response strong. So we do reinforce them intermittently for sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, and how, how are you coaching parents and other caregivers to kind of keep track of the, you know, probability stuff, you know, or is it something that like they, <laughs> that at a certain point of, of, I guess, uh, fluency with these sorts of things, uh, caregivers just kind of get a feel. It's like, you know what I've said? No, a couple of times now he's, 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 he's got to get a yes at some point or another, this whole thing falls yes. apart. Yes. And I think that's we coaching them. I'm not coaching them at this, this family in particular did not need coaching in terms of, you know, 30% of the time you're going to say yes to my way, 30% of the time you're going to push it to a tolerance response. And then other times you're going to push it to, we don't, we're not doing that. It's a, it, you're a parent. (laughs) You understand that sometimes you've had enough and it is no. So the, the family is reading not only their tone as a parent, their um, how much rope they have left. They're also reading the learner's emotional state. Can I say no now and keep this safe? Safety is our priority. I, that's part of our safety plan. We have a safety plan um, in the home for out of session, and that is part of our safety plan. That when, you know, it's really when you can say yes, say yes. As a parent, I think that's a, you know, that's what we try to do when a kid makes a request. He's this child is this client, this learner is saying, may I have my way, please. He's turning toward, um, you know, his father, as he said it, we, you know, we worked on tone, we worked on facial gaze shifting, we've worked on all those things as we worked on more of a complex functional communication response. So when his dad sees that, he says, he says yes, as much as he can. Or he'll, this, this learner has, has um, become very adapted to being able to wait. Yeah, sure, you could do that. But first you need to, and dad will use that kind of a response. Excellent. So, yeah. so the, they are, you know, these are gen, uh, generalizable skills. The, Matt, let me just inter, interject here. One of the things that we, um, you know, we had a consultation with the, um, the experts from FTF Consulting, because we were stuck on this particular case. And one of the things they said to us, you know, is we all know this, that trials matter, practice matters, um, to throw in as many practice sessions as you can during the day. So anytime this learner comes to his dad with the iPad and says, can I use it? Dad will say, yeah, let's do, you're ready to, pra- oh, great. You're ready to practice. Let's do some yeah. practice first. So we're getting a lot more practice in during the day. You know, I was just going to ask you for tips and tricks for for clinicians, and I think you you, you just delivered a, a a really good one there without even me having to ask. So that and that, I, and I don't want to take credit for it; that was given to me. Um, but it, it's really changed our implementation and our um, our success. He's getting many more practice sessions in a day. I didn't know how to get that in. Yeah, but this is you know, as soon as he comes to us with this iPad, we're like, "Hey, you ready? Great, sure." 
And I just want to add as well, with, when we had that consultation with Dr. G, she really, and we already knew this, that safety was paramount, but just, I remember just having like three sticking points in my head of um, immediate delivery of all suspected reinforcers and um, for any member of that response class and, and explaining that in a way that dad understood and even understanding like body positions material, like she broke it down even more um, in, in more of the details for us. Like you can reinforce when he does this with the iPad, you don't have to wait till the whole iPad is relinquished. You can, if he moves his finger here, you can reinforce that. And dad really, it was really socially significant to him because he saw it working. He saw, wow, I can stop this behavior and it's tracked by immediately delivering reinforcement and, um, identifying those reinforcers and discriminating those like dad became and still is pretty proficient in in that piece of it and understanding like safety is paramount that's and awesome. that guides his behavior yeah very cool um one of the things i want to get back to is the idea of developing a a complex functional communication response. You mentioned that just a second ago, Deirdre. Uh, do you find or have you found that sometimes clinicians want to get to the, the tolerance response and the, and the, and the cooperation responses too quickly and, and maybe not build out a, 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 a long, slow, deliberate, tone-appropriate functional communication response? I, I think so. I think Matt, that that was really important to me. I'm also a speech therapist, oh, so perfect. Yes. you know, so it's um, I understand pragmatic language, and I can remember going to um, an ABA conference in California, Cal Abba, several years ago, and watching a video where they were shaping up some um, communication with a was a young child, and they were calling success when the child was facing the wrong direction. I just about lost my mind. <laughs> <laughs> So, and, you know, I understand that we're going to, you know, we need to shape that further. We need to keep going. It's not, that is not a, um, a socially significant response. It may be a socially significant response. I shouldn't say it that harshly. Yeah, yeah, but it may it be is, a miracle for the, where this kid might've started yes, perhaps. But exactly. It's, but it's, no. we need to go farther. Yeah. We need to keep developing it. Um, so, you know, I'm always looking at, um, tone of voice is a real tough one. Um, but we work on that with this and we continue to work on it with him. Uh, remember, to, we call it speaking respectfully. You need to speak respectfully. And, you know, one of the biggest challenges with skill-based treatment is um, drift. And that's one of the things that we really have to watch. And we get, I, I just um, was speaking to our team about this uh, yesterday, that we're saying his name three times before he turns to us. We mm -hmm. had it shaped up. So we only said his name once two weeks ago. And that's a drift. We don't want to have to say his name three times. We want to say it once and wait and maybe touch or give it, you know, a nonverbal prompt, but we want to wait. So I think that, um, you know, this analysis part of this, of continuing to observe our sessions, continuing to analyze responses, continuing to look at what is appropriate for other learners of the same age and gender. Um, how do they respond? So I keep looking at what do what do other kids do? What do neurotypical kids do? They they do all kinds of things. They have a range of responses, um, but one of the most consistent responses that we see is that they stop and turn towards the um, speaker. So we've taken some time with that complex communication response, and you know that's where these the data sheets that are provided um, through FTF and through Hanley's group. Um, that guide you through the skill-based treatment. There's lots of trials in each um, each session, each practice session, and I followed it to the T. I became a very rigid um, person. I'm not usually so rigid. I became very rigid in, in implementing this protocol and following it to the T. That we are going to have, you know, uh, three sessions in a row, multiple trials in each session with um, no problem behaviors in those trials. And we're going to shape up this um, complex communication response. First, we defined what we were looking for. You know, the first thing was that he um, stopped what he was doing. That was the first response in the, in the functional communication response. And he turned toward his dad. So it has some nonverbal components 
also as well as the um, verbal or vocal component, however you want to describe that. Fascinating. So we took our time. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you get going into detail about that in terms and certainly your, your speech background gives you that, that uh, point of view of developmental norms and things like that, that some of us in, who are, you know, kind of more traditionally trained behavior analysts, uh, you know, perhaps haven't had the opportunity to learn. So that's a, a very salient point. Um, I, I I think we're getting uh, close to our uh, the time we have here. Um, so I'd like to kind of uh, perhaps round out with some, you know, perhaps uh, agency-wide or organizational questions here. Uh, uh, Deirdre, you mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, you got, this is an ongoing process. You guys, mm-hmm. you know, haven't gone, you, you haven't gotten to where you want to be. Where is that place where you guys want to be with this? Uh, you know, if we were to fast forward in like a year or two years or something like that, what, 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 what more agency wide uh, would you guys like to accomplish in the context of implementing this type of behavioral intervention framework? I think that we are, you know, we're looking at it from beginning to end. We're looking at how do we, um, I don't want to say beef up, but I'm going to, I guess, how do we beef up our intake process so Mm -hmm. that we're giving our clinicians the information that they need to um, deal with serious problem behavior quickly. And I don't mean quickly, like get through the process quickly, because we don't have those kind of Annie Sullivan moments where it's like, oh, there's a cure. We just don't have those moments. But so that we can go on the, get to the client on the ground and know what we're going to be um, facing what we need to address. So we look at it from that level, our intake level. Then we were looking at it from, Anne is looking at this um, from each clinician, each, um, our agency has grown exponentially. Um, Anne continues to meet with each uh, lead BCBA regularly and review cases. We also review cases as a group. Um, And when someone is talking about um, these kind of serious problem behaviors, we immediately connect them with um, our quote unquote ISCA team Mm -hmm. so that we're able to um, meet with that behaviorist and talk to them about what this is, what this involves and um, start to get them trained. We also bought the equipment that we need. So we had to add a line item to the budget um, for cameras and earbuds because I was requesting them all the time. And they're like, wait, 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 we've got to you know, figure out what we're doing here. Um, and add a, how much are we going to need in a year? So we figured out that kind of what kind of equipment do we need? Because the reality is that I say we're doing this little off label that, you know, how you use a drug off label yeah. mm-hmm. that, you know, the ISCA protocols, the practical functional analysis and skill-based treatment was not built for um, synchronous telehealth. That's not how it was developed. That's how we're using it. Um, So what we do is we pair the um, clinician who has a, has a learner with serious problem behaviors um, with usually it's right now it's with me um, with a uh, clinician who's had more training and experience. We, we are, our clinicians are um, actively and eagerly taking trainings with, um, with FTF. So, and now they're online, so they're asynchronous. You can take them, you know, whenever you want to. So we have people taking trainings all the time. So we're building up our, our capacity that way. But the way that we're, we're doing this is we're working people through the practical functional analysis um, workbook with each client. Um, we've already had the open-ended interview done in our intake process. Um, we're working with parents so that they understand the process. And then when we go to do a practical functional analysis, um, we do it through synchronous telehealth where the um, BCBA in the home is uh, is running the um, practical functional analysis. I'm talking to them through earbuds and letting them know, okay, we've been five to seven minutes in the uh, synthesized reinforcement condition. It looks like we have a happy, relaxed, and engaged learner. It's time now to progress the EO. Before that, we have practiced how you progress the EO, so everybody knows how to do that. Um, everybody knows what their body posture should be in the synthesized reinforcement condition because we practiced that beforehand. We've done all of this remotely. Um, and then we walk them through that process while um, someone remotely is collecting the data. Uh, as they do skill-based treatment, we have someone remotely coaching and taking the data. So the person who's doing the implementing is not trying to take the data at the same time. 
So it's been a commitment on our agency um, to assure that, you know, treatment plans allow for this, that we have the equipment that we need, that we're give, that we are supporting people in training. Um, so that's, that's been how I think, and unless you want to add anything as an agency, how we're supporting this, this buildup of, um, getting a staff, we, you know, more and more, Matt, we're getting, um, we're getting learners who have what are called chirp waivers. And in Colorado, that's a waiver to keep, uh, learners in the home who exhibit very serious, dangerous behaviors and who are at risk for, um, out of home placement. And we're getting more and more referrals for these clients. So we're, you know, as we get the referrals, we're building a team that has the skills to address these serious problem behaviors safely. Yep. And yep. And, yeah. And I just wanted to add too, just even as an agency, as we're going through this training and um, with the practical functional assessment and skill-based treatment process and really prioritizing the safety and social acceptability of this um, it's first getting our clinicians on board and understanding that, and that that whole pro- this whole process is to prevent escalating problem behavior. Um, and what we've been doing with Deidre because it's it's been so helpful. I mean, she's our like resident. I know she doesn't like to be called expert, but she's delved into this and she is our resident expert on this process, but we've had interactive dis- uh, discussions, role play um, and authentic application and feedback sp- and continued feedback. Um, and it's really helped our clinicians improve skills, not only to identify those synthesized reinforcers right from the beginning, but how to design and implement safe, efficient and useful um, treatments. And, and analyses from these interviews and designing these skill-based treatments. I mean, we still have to, we have a lot to learn. I think it, the more research that comes back and the more evidence, of, um, I mean, it's been, it's been life-changing for a lot of these families and the trajectory of where these kids who were severe, like Deidre just mentioned, have changed because they were heading down this, this path to um, residential being removed from the homes. So it's been pretty amazing to see. Outstanding. And sounds like uh, there's quite a bit of social validity uh, to, uh, mm-hmm. you know, confirm what you guys are doing is the yeah. is the right path. So uh, this has been a, a, a fascinating conversation. Uh, I've learned a lot personally, and I know the, uh, the audience will too. So uh, Anna Deidre, thank you so much for joining me today. This is, this has just been a treat. Thanks, Matt. We, we really appreciate, appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.